computer. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to Toolkit Tuesday. We're super excited to be here this morning with an amazing keynote speaker and a dear friend, uh, Maria Ross. Thank you for joining us today. Thanks for having me. This is fun. Yeah, I'm excited. Um, I have had the opportunity and privilege of hearing Maria speak at several conferences um, as the event planner, but had the chance to watch her and enjoy her message. Uh, she's located in the Bay Area and she is a brand strategist. And I love that in your bio, Maria, it says that you believe cash flow, creativity, and compassion are not mutually exclusive. I love that about the work that you're doing. And she's recently authored a book, The Empathy Edge. So I want, we kind of have twofold today. I want her to share some of her experiences as a keynote speaker, what she's work, you know, working with as a delivering content digitally, but also information about being an empathetic leader and how that can serve us all given the, the scenario that we're all in at the <laughs> moment. But so welcome again, I appreciate you being here. Thank um, you. How are you so holding fun. up? I know you've got a little one at home. We're good. It's I say every day is a victory at this point <laughs> when we hit happy hour at the end of the day. Yes. Um, six year old at home. So as I was telling you, Lynn, young enough that they need to be a little, uh, they can't be quite self-directed, but old enough that they have opinions. Yes. So, uh, the lessons at home have been a little challenging and nobody wants their mom to be their teacher. So there's been a lot of running back and forth between work and that. And, you know, by the time we get to the end of the day, it's exhausting, but wow. probably a common tale for many people in the audience right now. <laughs> well, and as we um, talked about a little bit, empathy is part of your, you know, your really interesting approach around leadership. But I, I was saying you must have an increased empathy for the teach home, the teachers as <laughs> taking on the teaching role. Has that been a for sure. walk in their shoes experience? Yeah, it has. And it's actually, you know, tempered my communications with them and just trying to, again, trying to see that other side. And I don't, I don't always default to that. So I think that's why I wrote a book about empathy as a competitive advantage is because I needed some of that research, and some of those habits myself, but I have found myself like weirdly going back to my own book and okay, what did I say about how to shore up your own empathy here? Because I really need it today <laughs> and people are driving me crazy, but all of us are in that boat right now where there's so much stress and there's so much change that everyone's adapting to. And we have to find empathy for our clients, for our colleagues, for our customers, for our families, spouses, kids. I mean, there's never been a more collective exercise of empathy than right now. And I've actually been heartened to see so much of it being talked about in the business world where, you know, when I started writing this book in 2016, people were like, I don't get empathy in business. Like, uh -uh. you know, it's not a soft skill, but now we're seeing all these successful leaders talking about it. Brands are showing up with empathy and compassion and they're winning, you know, they are showing up and they are uh, bolstering customer loyalty, they're bolstering um, awareness and goodwill. And so it's something that is on the tip of everyone's tongue right now in the context of business, which is really wonderful to see. And because also, you know, we're all, many of us are now working from home, varying degrees of technological capabilities. <laughs> I mean, yes. I've been working from since 2008, I've been using Zoom for years, but remembering that there's these industries and people that are getting used to this all quickly for the first time and, mm -hmm. and we're being let into their homes now, you know, into their bedrooms and their guest bedrooms. I had, a, I had a call with a CEO the other day where he was in this floral bedroom. <laughs> <Let's> <laughs> Purple flowers had thrown up everywhere and it was a peek into his life, right? And, and you, you can't not be a little vulnerable, let your guard down and get to know people as people when we're in this environment. So maybe if there's anything we take away from it, it's, it's that like, like the facade's gone. <laughs> right. Right. Unless they have some weird zoom backdrop. That's <laughs> Which is even weirder. It creeps me out a little bit. <laughs> it's a little weird. Um, yeah. How, and I want our event planner community to hear from you. How are you experiencing the events that you're involved with that are going digital and you as a keynoter, what has that, what have been some of the wins and the challenges around that? Yeah, it's been so crazy because I launched my book in October and I had a lot of live events and keynotes planned for this first quarter. And, you know, there was one week where I saw 
like $45,000 in speaking contracts disappear in one week because mm. a meeting got canceled here and another one went virtual there, you know, all these kinds of things. But I have been lucky enough to still with the bigger conferences and some of the, even the corporate ones are like, oh yeah, we're going to do it on Zoom. We're going to, or we're going to have some platform that we're using. So the experience for me, number one, it's been great because I don't have to travel, but as a speaker, when you enjoy speaking in front of an audience, you miss that connection with people and that instantaneous response and just delight that you get from being in front of them. And you're also able to read the room. If you're, you know, if you're a good speaker, you can read the room a little bit better and adjust your tone, adjust your pace. You know, oh, clearly I'm losing everybody right now. Let's yeah. do something else. So that's been challenging. And I think it's brought for me and some other speakers I know an extra level of energy to the talks that we're doing because we don't know what's happening on the other side of the screen. So we're like, okay, let's just make this the best damn speech we can. And you know, not that you don't always, but again, you can't adapt in the moment right. very easily. The other thing that's been challenging is obviously the different platforms, depending on the event production company and the organization. With Zoom, I'm, I'm there, I'm done. Like I know how to use it. As I mentioned, I've been using it for years. I was recently on a summit where the dry runs were kind of a cluster for all the speakers involved and, and the production team was, was spending all the time on the dry run with them figuring out what they needed to do to the point that we were like, I don't think we need to be here for this. <laughs> like, oh, interesting. And I've got a kid, I've got to go home school right now and I've got like all this other demands on my time. So, um, but in the end it went, it went off flawlessly as is the superpower of most event planners. <laughs> But um, it's, it was, it's getting used to those different platforms and, and getting used to production teams figuring out how to work together and work with their clients. So they're, they're sort of under double pressure because they're trying to make sure they know what they're looking, they, make sure they know what they're doing in front of the speakers, but also their clients are on the line with right. them. So I've had a great deal of empathy for them. I don't know that other speakers might, but you know, they're, they're really trying to make sure they're showing up and, and doing the right thing. So the technology has been challenging sometimes. The inability to, to connect with and interact with the audience, even if you can see chat and reactions, it's just not the same thing. Hmm. I have enjoyed the smaller events that were like 20 or 30 people where they actually left Zoom cameras on. And what I did as a speaker was I just made eye contact, even though they didn't know it, with different faces on the screen. And right. that at least helped me feel a connection with the audience. So I think if there's any opportunity to show some faces on the screen, um, that would be wonderful for speakers. But um, it's been Yeah, I think that right? testing around, you know, because it's a new tool, planners just, they want to test, 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 you know, they just want to know it's going to work. Yes. And you're right. So that being mindful of a speaker's time and not having them hang around with all the technical talk, but be ready yeah. to just have them simply make sure they know where to click and how to get there. Yeah. Um, I find it interesting though, because the speakers in, in the live events, they would show up and they'd be able to focus on their message and they would just know that they'd be handed a mic, you know, been mic'd up and then they would be able to, be, the lighting would be right on the stage because we've, you know, painstakingly a whole day of stage wash, lighting, yes. testing. And so you really didn't <laughs> have to do any of the, the technical part, but no. now it seems like, and I have to say, even just from doing these toolkit videos and the Tuesdays and the summits, um, having to worry about the technology and your message at the same time feels very stressful to me. And it's I'm not a so professional. Speaker. Is it stressful to be like, so make stressful. sure I'm clicking on the right thing? And Yeah. And like, Oh, you know, that's why it's so great when you have meeting producers and planners that are like, we're taking care of the Q and a we're taking care of this. We'll have, you know, someone actually moderating it, even if it was supposed to just be a keynote. Right. Right. And let's say you were doing a keynote where you were taking Q and a at the end, have that person that's sort of emceeing you and then taking care of the technical stuff. So that, you know, I'm not the one that has to worry about if there's a person that oh, I, can't, I can't get my sound to go on, like, blah, yes. blah, blah, blah. like take care of all of that for your speakers um, is key. One, one little best practice I thought I'd mention from, from the summit that I did last week was um, even though it was a little painful when they, they had to switch or alter platforms at the last minute because 
of a good thing, they got an influx of a bunch of new registrations and they weren't able to use the platform in completion that they thought they were going to be able to use before. They actually got the product manager from the tech company on the dry run with us. So there was no nice. like, there was no delay of, oh, I don't know if we can do that. Let me check with the company. Like the product manager was on, he was very techy, but he was on right there and they were able to go, you know, so-and-so is the speaker able to do that? And he was able to go, oh yes, all, all you have to do is this, that, and the other thing. And I thought that that was really effective to save time and save stress. That's a great hot tip. Love it. Mm -hmm. It's a great toolkit tip to just make sure that it, because it, you know, we have a certain base of knowledge around technology, but they're, mm -hmm. because these are new engagements with these, these platforms and these tech tools, having that technical person engaged when, during your speaker tests, I think are amazing. Um, right. Cause then you're, me, you're not guessing. You're just yeah, like, exactly. yeah, you're right there and you're answering our question. You know, the tech, like, Right. And that tech talk makes you just feel a little bit more comfortable <laughs> that he's got that going on. I will say that what we, one thing we learned from this weekend, we had a virtual um, event, digital event. Mm -hmm. We, I, I think it's so key what you said. You need an MC that's got that kind of host, hostess tone mm -hmm. and can facilitate Q&A. Um, but then you also need the technical monitor that's watching the session that can sure. field those technical questions. So it's almost, you know, you have to kind of, double layer mm -hmm. each session with a couple of different um, service professionals yeah. that can handle those questions. So yeah, I don't know, just, it just, we were trying to do both. Our, our MCs were trying to handle the tech and that was stretching them a little bit. So, you know, lessons learned. Um, tell me about the, the empathy edge and how that, well, first kind of how did that come about for you to take on that topic and then how it serves you as a business owner. And when you work with your brands, just, Tell us a little bit, what is, how do you define empathy, I guess, to start? Well, empathy in a business context, not to bore you, but there's been lots of definitions over time. And really where we've come to in modern times is that you can look at empathy, not just from the feeling what someone else is feeling, but also seeing things from their point of view. So how I define it for the purpose of the book and what makes the most sense in business is seeing things from another person's point of view and where appropriate feeling, if that's appropriate in that context, but you don't necessarily have to have gone through what they're going through to see things from their point of view. And the most important part is then to use that information to take action, use that information to adapt your communications, use that information to adapt what your next steps might be. It's not just being nice and it's not caving in to somebody mm. either. That is not the definition of empathy. The definition of empathy is about, it, it's more about a mindset of perspective taking. And are you able to be confident enough in your own skin, mindful enough in the situation, curious enough to try to figure out what the other person's point of view is so that you can have a productive conversation? Not again, so you can just give them whatever they want. Um, yeah. And I, I talk a lot in my talks about one of the most empathetic bosses I ever had was someone who laid off the entire marketing team. But it was the way that he did it and his support mm. and his communication and his um, just everything about it was, it was not a decision he really wanted to make. It was not something we wanted to hear, but um, he proved that he's an empathetic leader in the way that he adapted to what the needs of those in front of him were. And I think that's one of, one of the easiest ways to think about empathy is, are you in the moment adapting to the person and the context in front of you? That's where you can really be empathetically fluent and you can quite honestly just get more done. Like that was the whole point of the book was curating all this research around um, the, d the data, around what makes companies that are empathetic successful, cultures that are empathetic successful, and leaders who are empathetic, what makes them successful, to show that it's not an either or. Like you mentioned at the beginning, cash flow, creativity, and compassion. For too long, we've subscribed to this thing that business has to be cutthroat and take no prisoners, and you can't mm -hmm. be ambitious and kind. You can't be compassionate and effective. And the data and the research and all these, these wonderful companies I highlighted in the book show that you don't have to. And we're seeing it now in this current crisis. The brands that are acting with compassion and empathy that are showing up, the Zooms, the Nordstroms, the Canlis in Seattle, they're going right. to win coming out of this. Like from a pure practical business standpoint, and, mo and you can tell that they're all doing it from genuine purpose. They're not just like sitting in a boardroom going, how can we look empathetic right now? Right. right. 
It's right. stemming from who they are as a brand. And that's why I always say every, all of this has to start from the inside out. It can't be something you just do for optics. Yes. Because people will be able to tell. Yeah. I think if you're disingenuous, they'll, that, that gets exposed real quick. I did have an experience as we were preparing for this week's conversation uh, with a client, a corporate uh -huh. client that was preparing some upcoming digital events and they were, their programming was really focused, forward focused on mm -hmm. services they provide. And they just kind of were going on and on about what story they wanted to tell. And I just had this, it bubbled up for me and I was like, this is great content. Right. But I think we're not, we're not addressing, you know, meeting them where they're at, you know, they're, mm -hmm. if they're struggling and we're trying to show them and sell them new tools, right. We, I think we need to address that somehow. And it's interesting because I have felt, uh, trying to be thoughtful about empathy in even messaging, messaging mm -hmm. to sponsors that have invested money that now can't come to a live event and get their lead gen going, mm -hmm. you know, um, and just a, striking a, a tone and a balance that it is empathetic around what's really happening for everybody. You know, empathy for our vendors that we have booked, you know, hundreds of thousands of dollars of revenue to come be in their space and eat right. their food and watch their, you know, get their AV gear. Yeah. And now we're just taking our ball going home. How do we, how do we communicate with those partners in a way that is yeah. mindful of what we've done to their, their business? Yeah, I love that you said that because I'm actually in the midst of drafting one of my newest articles for my entrepreneur column on how to, we, we keep hearing we need to pivot, but what does that actually mean? How do we do it, right? And one of the things is to show up, but don't be tone deaf. Like now mm -hmm. is not the time for aggressive sales tactics. It doesn't mean we have to stop selling or feel guilty about being able to offer value, but exactly what you said, be where your customers are, meet them where they are. Yeah. And so I have an exercise that might be helpful for anyone, whether your client or customer is a, is a small business or a large company or a marketing executive or whatever is you probably to be successful, have an ideal customer profile. Hopefully mm -hmm. you do, right? Yes. Like, who is this person? What do they care about? What keeps them up at night? Not just like, we target event planners or whatever it is, you know? Right. And so who is this person as a person? Well, now their situation has slightly changed. So sit down with a pen and paper and think of 10 to 20 things that are true for that person right now in the midst of the turmoil we're going through. So as an example, I work with, you know, fast growth companies and VPs of marketing CMOs um, or solopreneurs. And I'm like, okay, they are worried about their jobs right now. They are worried about where revenue is going to dry up. They're worried about pipeline. They're worried about losing good employees or having to lay people off. There's all these things that are true for them that were never in my ideal customer profile before. Obviously revenue always was, but in terms of like, where is the revenue going to come from right now? Right. Are people spending? Yeah. So, and then think about how you can pivot your messaging, your sales pitch, your content, your social media posts, your blogs, your newsletters, to address where they are right now. And so some companies, this is all about knowing your customer. Some companies, their customers need a very soft sell approach. They need to just be reassured. We're here for you. What do you need? Let, you know, we're going to ask you what you need. I know other companies that their clients are in a tailspin. They are like deer in headlights right now. And they need the company to tell them what to do. Mm, interesting. Someone who's prescriptive right now because they're freaking out. So that's about empathy for your customers and knowing that not everybody is the same. And so with, with your customers, where are they on that? Do they need support or do they need prescription? <laughs> right. That is so tactical, Maria. I appreciate yeah. that so much because it's true the defining that customer, but then mm -hmm. layering these new experiences mm -hmm. that, that we think they may be having at this particular time yes. can drive, can drive our approach. I think that's, that's amazing. Right. And empathy has always been really important in marketing as we know, but especially now, like, for example, with event planners, you know, are your end clients freaking out because their events going virtual right now? Like they need confidence. They need like, this is what we're going to do. Boom, boom, boom. Others might need to have a little more control to feel comfortable with what's going on. So maybe it needs to be a little bit more of a collaborative. Here's what we're thinking about. What do you, what do you think about that? It's all about knowing where they are. And like I was saying earlier, the empathy fluency. In the yeah. 
That's, I think it's such a strong leadership trait, you know, and I find as event planners that we wear so many hats and, you know, I, I used to say, you know, they're buying peace of mind mm -hmm. um, and, you know, I, they would get to whatever, a couple of weeks out and they didn't have the ticket sales and they, I would feel like they, the doctor's in and they just need to lay on the couch and you just all of a sudden have to become some sort of a resource therapist. for them to yeah. bring, yes, therapist, <laughs> please lay down on my couch. Totally. I promise the registrations are coming. Don't, don't worry about it. So no. I feel like we wear a lot of hats. And so to be um, tuned into this leadership trait and how to, Mm -hmm. And especially as we move back, and I, as I say, kind of move back online and back into business, I mm -hmm. think there's going to be interesting territory depending on who your client is. And, um, you know, we have clients that are tech companies that have had minimal impact. You know, they, they've been used, they, all their people yeah. got up and running at home and, right. you know, the big brands the, up here in Seattle, we work with those and mm -hmm. they're, they're kind of, I, I wouldn't say immune to it, but they the impact hasn't been as great, you know, as right. a state association whose annual conference generated their entire operating budget for a year. Yeah. And now they're, now they're looking at, you know, how are we going to actually mm -hmm. st stay afloat as a nonprofit trade association without the revenue of this conference? And, you know, so then they're looking to us to be the, you know, the financial the advisor. advisors and figure yeah. that out. But totally. I just think empathy is a, it's a strong skill set that we don't really get taught i don't think where do you do you where do you find people on the empathy continuum do they well, are they yeah where are they yeah I, I love that question and just real quick remembering also that your speakers are an audience i have to like represent a little bit yes please that. represent we <laughs> love our speakers that, just slightly on that is remember that they're freaking out too and so communication like i'm having a really hard time getting answers from a conference that i'm it went virtual i spent time recording a session for them and they've gone dark on me. And I'm like, mm. where did all that work go? Like, I know you're going to need me to do the interactive part of it, but are you going to tell me the day before? Like, and I'm again, empathy, trying to sh juggle work and homeschooling. And like, so having that empathy for your speakers too, and, and trying to give them as much information as you have when you have it is great. Um, That's a great tip. So uh, just to mention that, but yeah, everyone, everyone comes at this at a different, you were saying, where are they on the empathy spectrum? The good news is that the excuse of I'm not a naturally empathetic person is BS um, mm. because science shows that as humans, we are hardwired in our DNA for empathy, unless you're a sociopath, but that's like a different thing. <laughs> um, but what happens is the muscle atrophies for some people over time. So either they're environments that don't foster and model and reward it. Maybe they mm. grew up in a, Dif difficult family situation, or maybe they've had it beaten out of them by their current workplace culture. Like it, it's all about, you know, have they gone to the empathy gym in a while? Maybe not. And so when that happens, you just have to force yourself to adopt some of the habits and strategies and they will feel forced at first, but the more that you do them, the more it becomes part of your standard operating procedure. So that, you know, just like, you know, you can have the six pack abs too, if you want, but you got to keep going to the gym versus the person that already has them. Right. They don't yes. have to think about it. You might have to think about you, you might, you know, you're going to be sore the next day after you get back from the gym. <laughs> empathy <laughs> jumping jacks. I love empathy it. Empathy jumping jacks. Totally. So, so I have a series of habits and practices in the book. And I think I mentioned this. I, I wrote this book also for me because I, I need help with, with being empathetic in very tense moments. And mm -hmm. I've, I've found myself in recent weeks going back to like, okay, what are some of those tips? You know, getting curious is a huge way to flex your empathy muscle, taking the focus off your concerns and what you want to say. And when you're hit with either resistance or you're trying to get that empathetic point of view, be curious, ask questions. Why do you feel that way? How do you see that as being successful? You know, what, what about that solution makes you think that that's a better option for us than this versus what we default to, which is no, here's why I'm right and you're wrong. Right. right. Yeah. Especially those of us that are consultants or in advisory roles. And so get curious and let yourself be comfortable with letting the person express why they have the opinion they have and what the context is for them. And sometimes that context is not business related. It's very personal. It's they have an aging parent at home. They're mm -hmm. juggling homeschooling right now. And that's why they're being so difficult to work with. So the more that you can ask questions, the more a person can tell you what their point of view is. And then right. you don't have to guess, right? So that's I love that idea. I love that idea of being curious. I, I heard recently someone saying, um, 
you, the use of tell me more. And it was, it was at a, in a digital event. It just, it, you know, you pick up a nugget sometime. Yes. And I, I heard that and it was in the context of negotiation, you mm -hmm. know, tell me more about why you have this budget or whatever it might be, but right. it, it, it's, um, mm -hmm. I'm hearing it again from you, which is mm -hmm. that the listening part of a leader or of a, as a, uh, a contractor or a customer mm -hmm. that year. Um, and I, I think that I'd love that you've shared like some tactical ideas, Maria, I want to make sure people know how to find your great content. So can you just share the best way to connect sure. with you? Uh, my hub is at red-slice.com, but I'm active on LinkedIn, Maria J. Ross. I'm, at, I'm building my activity on Instagram, Red Slice Maria. I'm on Twitter at Red Slice, and I have a Facebook page, Red Slice. Um, so I also have a column on entrepreneur.com. So I publish there occasionally, but most of the time it's going to be through my blog and through LinkedIn. And that's where I'm sharing a lot of good stuff. Um, also building up a YouTube channel right now because I've been developing a lot of content and, and trying to get that out there. So, um, yeah, that's, how well, that's amazing. And I know for our planners, you know, Marie is available to speak. She's incredible, uh, a, a very timely message for us. She's Thank great you. to work with a true pro, um, and her content that she does produce is, is helpful for anybody at any role at any place in their, you know, what they're dealing with right now. And empathy's huge. And, um, you're just a rock star. I really appreciate you, you joining Me us too. today <laughs> and good luck with everything. Hang in there with your little one and being a, Thank teacher, you. <laughs> a teacher and a professional speaker. <laughs> <laughs> and um, again, all you toolkit folks, you can um, follow Maria J. Ross or, or also look up Red Slice or Consultancy. Yes. So. And I just want to say shout out to the heroics of all the event planners right now because I've had to plan like 40 city road shows before. So I see you, <laughs> I feel you. And as I was telling you, Lynn, before this call, you're in a profession where when things go right, nobody appreciates you. And then when things go wrong, everybody blames you. So just know that the speakers are on your side. Oh, thank you so much, yeah. Maria. It was great to see you today in person. We'll talk soon. All right. And uh, for the rest of the toolkit, folks, I also want to make sure you know we had an amazing virtual summit last week, and we'll be making that video content available uh, at no charge for all of our event planner community to uh, see how we pulled off a virtual summit and lessons learned. So take care, everybody. Thanks for joining us. Thanks, Maria.